Paul Thron with the Canada First Immigration Reform Committee. Well, I'm wanting to wish you a very happy Dominion Day. I know some people call it Canada Day, but I want to talk to talk to you about why I still celebrate Dominion Day and I still celebrate under the flag of the real Canada, the Red Ensign. In 1965, two revolutionary things occurred. Uh, one was that the Canada's traditional flag, the Red Ensign, was replaced by the flag we have today. The, the present flag is a rather illogical flag, you know, the, the two red bars, the red maple leaf, and, and the white background. And if you ask people what does it, what does it mean, well, they're kind of vague. Uh, the two red bars, we're told, uh, uh, stand for the, the oceans, the Atlantic and Pacific. Well, you know, as one of my students years ago uh, chimed in when I mentioned that, but Mr. Fromm, seas are blue. He's right. And uh, the, the red of the maple leaf, while it's attractive, uh, when the maple leaf is red, it's dying. Well, I'd like to talk a little bit about this flag. This is the red ensign. This was the flag of the traditional Canada, the real Canada, and it's so meaningful. Look at the uh, Union Jack up in the top left-hand corner. Uh, that stands for, the, for the, one of our main languages, English, the source of our legal and, uh, and uh, government uh, traditions, the British parliamentary system. Um, and it also contains the Christian cross. Now, I know there are people who, who reject Christianity, but this country was based on Christianity. The, the fact that we have a system that doesn't allow people to die in the streets or, or, or die of illness uncared for traces back to our Christian roots. These aren't Judaic roots. These aren't Muslim roots. These are Christian roots, and this is the real Canada. Then, of course, the red and the flag. So passionate, a commitment to, uh, uh, to blood and to life and to thriving. And then the crest, so meaningful. I'm just kicking off the surface. There's the fleur de lis of the French people who, who form such an important part of Canada. Uh, there's the, there are the symbols of, of, of Scotland and Ireland and, and, and England. And then the three maple leaves, green, the sign of life. Uh, and that's important, life. Uh, we are a, we're, we're a thriving country. And the maple leaves, well, the, the vast force of our country. And the, the three joined in one. Uh, have different interpretations. One say it's the original European settlers because we are our founding people were European, our founding settler people. The second maple leaf would be the existing native people. And the third the third maple leaf would be all the people, mostly Europeans, who came later. Uh, this is the, the flag that emphasizes, emphasizes the, Euro, the the European uh, nature of this country. Our founding settler people were European. Well, in 1965, Lester B. Pearson was about to pull off a revolution, and that was to turn our backs on our traditional source of immigration, which was the British Isles and Europe, and throw the doors open to the Third World. The long-range plan was, was to be the replacement of the European founding settler people within a century. In fact, with the present mass immigration, 85% from the third world, can, uh, the European founding settler people will be replaced by 2050. By 2050, we will be a minority. And in order to, um, to facilitate that, Pearson changed the flag because our present flag means virtually nothing. That flag was a reminder of our roots that this is a European country. That's why I, uh, I celebrate Dominion Day. And I sign up programs from White Resistance Radio. I'm on the fighting side of me. Check it out, White Resistance Radio. I sign off with the anthem of the real Canada, the Maple Leaf Forever. This is Paul Tron from the Canada First Immigration Reform Committee wishing you a very happy Dominion Day. So anyway, this is Diane King interviewing Paul Fromm in Toronto, June 2017. We're going to be discussing the attack of, on free speech in Canada at large. Uh, last time we had an interview with Paul, he told us about the attack he gets dealing in the free speech arena, immigration, and so forth. And now 
we are going to hear about the broader scope of how Canada has come under attack in, in their own free speech. Thank you, Paul. Welcome. Well, it's very good to, to be on. Uh, one of the, the great rebel uh, uh, video um, shows of, of our time. It's good to be on one of the uh, alternative uh, truth media uh, up here on the, uh, on the, the internet. Uh, and I'd like to start, before we get into the topic itself, with a rather encouraging uh, uh, note. <coughs> uh, uh, when I first got active in the free speech movement in the early 80s, uh, I would find that the enemies of free speech, usually elements of the Jewish lobby, uh, when they uh, were pushing for some new restriction on free speech, would always start off with, uh, well, I'm in favor of free speech, but, okay, there comes the but, but uh, they always felt under an obligation to at least pay lip service to freedom of speech. Um, more recently, a, a fairly sizable a number of uh, uh, people uh, will say to you, uh, well, you, you can't have unlimited freedom of speech, and that, that always worries me. Uh, I'm sure even... Uh, uh, Kim Jong-un would, would agree with that. Uh, it's then just a matter of degree. It, there isn't that commitment to, to a, a real belief in freedom. Uh, and, and then, uh, just last uh, weekend in Vancouver, uh, I was sponsoring, or Cafe was sponsoring, one of the great German free speech uh, warriors, uh, Alfred uh, Schaefer, and this was actually uh, our second to, to last meeting, and uh, he went. Uh, uh, he went and chatted with uh, some relatives of his. One of them, uh, uh, quite a handsome young guy, uh, a law student, and so on. And, and, and this fellow was definitely not on side for freedom of speech, and that's kind of a worry. I mean, the guy's going to be a lawyer. Um, they're supposed to be part of our front line in defense of, uh, of our rights. And so Alfred was trying to stimulate him or get a reaction out of him. He said, well, did you hear about the incident at Harvard University this past week? And he had not. And apparently what had happened is that some, stu some student who'd gotten uh, admission uh, had, uh, was ratted out by somebody who saw something he posted on Facebook, which we are told was an anti-Semitic uh, posting. Now, of course, we don't have the details, so there's no way we can judge. That's just somebody's label. Well, apparently, that was enough. Harvard yanked his admission. Now, that will probably uh, seriously damage that young guy's life. If he'd gone to Har Harvard and graduated, he probably would be able to write his own ticket, uh, both, both professionally and financially. I mean, it's a, it's a real prestige university. Now... Uh, I'm sure you'll be able to get into some other university, but th this is a big setback in the fellow's career. So uh, Alfred was asking the, this young lawyer in training, uh, well, what do you think of it? Uh, he said, well, well, it would depend on what he posted. No, 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 that's not, that's not the right answer. Uh, whatever happened to this fellow's freedom of speech? You know, regardless of what he said, and we don't know what he said, uh, but clearly it wasn't criminal, he did, wasn't threat threatening somebody with with death or mayhem, um, but, but uh, he, uh, he, he just didn't get it. Uh, uh, in other words, uh, for a, a disturbing number of people in our society, uh, freedom of speech means freedom to say what they approve of. Well, I'm afraid that's not freedom of speech. That's, that's the same freedom the, 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 the poor slaves in, in North Korea have. It's only a matter of degree. But I said I was actually working around to something positive. And the positive thing has to do with the very medium we're working uh, with this afternoon. Um, <coughs> I, I would say 10, 15 years ago, the young people that we were attracting into the movement quite often had good feelings, and good sentiments, good instincts, but did not have a lot of knowledge. Now we are getting young people in their late teens, 20s, and, and, and so on, who are entirely self-educated, not because of our largely rotten education system, and usually not because of a mentor in the movement or something like that, and quite often not even because of reading, but because of the 
volume of good material that's up there uh, on the uh, uh, on the al uh, on the alternative media up, uh, on the internet, particularly videos. I, I'm very enthusiastic about this as a medium because that's really where a lot of people are at, and we have to, I think, those of us that are trying to. Uh, convince people of the need for real immigration reform and for maintaining our freedom of speech and for honesty in history. Uh, we have to meet people where they are uh, rather than you know, perhaps where some might like them to be. Certainly we, we went through many generations of publishing good books and they, st they still have to be published. But a lot of people sadly are not book readers. We have to reach them where, where they are and I'm very encouraged that there is there's some evidence that good people are, are educating themselves and becoming active. I appreciate that. Okay, that is very positive. Uh, now let's uh, get to reality. <laughs> well, that's part of the reality. I understand. I understand. The uh, uh, difficulty in free speech, when it kind of uh, began, how the little people, Brad Love, Mark Lemire, how they were brought into, the, <coughs> into this, this battle and were attacked, hunted down basically. And it's more than a witch hunt. This was a, almost like a criminal endeavor by this one individual. And they, he would be skulking about on storm fronts, sometimes even provoking this uh, kind of reaction. Can, if you can remember when that first started and the, the, the little people players that were involved in that. And um, I, you've got a really good memory about uh, the characters, and that's really important. Uh, people that don't usually get mentioned. Okay, to, to sort of paint the big picture. In Canada, uh, freedom of speech uh, can be restricted in, in, in two ways. One by government and one by, uh, secondly, by um, uh, businesses and, uh, and uh, institutions. Um, <coughs> you can be fired for having the wrong opinion, not even necessarily political opinion, and more and more not, not opinion expressed at work, opinion expressed on Facebook or in the case of one poor uh, devil, uh, perhaps some off-color remarks he made at a soccer match. So the, 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 that's one area you can be punished. The, then, of course, there is the, the there is the uh, the legal area. Uh, there are laws, and, and that's I think a large, it's somewhat different from the United States, where where you have the First Amendment. We have a, a charter of rights and freedoms, uh, which is uh, a completely empty and phony document. It promises all sorts of uh, uh, freedoms in Section 2B, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, freedom of belief, freedom of the press, you know, all those good things. Uh, but most people have not read Section 2A, which says you have all the freedoms in 2B, uh, subject only to such limitations as are demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. What that really means is, uh, 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 well, uh, restrictions that, that can be justified in a democratic society. And that simply means if a legislature or the parliament passes a restriction, uh, that's okay. It was democratic. Well, the, not quite exactly. The courts have said, well, the, the government has to have a, a good purpose in mind. And as long as it and if to achieve its good purpose, it restricts a right, like let's say freedom of speech. That's all right, provided it doesn't go too far. So yeah, you don't really have the rights. Uh, so let, under uh, first of all, we well, I think we have to f look at the two uh, major th forces behind restricting free speech in Canada. The biggest force, going way back to the 1930s, uh, was the organized Jewish lobby. In those days, the Canadian Jewish Congress. Uh, they lobbied ferociously all through the 30s and 40s and 50s and, and into the 1960s for restrictions on free speech. Or they would call it hate speech. But hate is really any, is, is not speech that, that says hateful things, but it's speech that the person using that term hates. Uh, so uh, the, for a long time they weren't successful, but as times changed in the 1960s, uh, they eventually got a, uh, a, a carefully uh, selected Royal Commission to study hate propaganda. Uh, and the way things work in our country, if the politicians are looking for an excuse to do something but haven't quite got the courage to do it, they'll appoint a Royal Commission, the Royal Commission will come up with recommendations, and then they can say, well look at all these expert people have studied the issue and 
this is what they want. Well, the way the way you uh, 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 you uh, cook those books is, is to uh, uh, appoint people to the royal commission who agree with whatever result you want. So the Jews were or the Jewish lobby was uh, pushing for hate uh, anti anti free speech so-called hate legislation, and on that royal commission, the, the royal commission on hate propaganda was appointed uh, Dean Maxwell Cohen, who was uh, not Irish. Uh, Cohen uh, was the dean of the McGill Law School and a former president of the Canadian Jewish Conference. Also on the royal, uh, the royal commission was Saul Hayes, a former, uh, a former president of the Canadian Jewish Congress. Jews are about 1% of Canada. There's seven people on the royal commission. Another was an obscure, in those days, obscure <coughs> left-wing intellectual from Quebec named Pierre Elliott Trudeau. He was a great admirer of Fidel Castro and, and Chairman Mao. Do you, you get the picture? <laughs> so anyway, uh, not surprisingly, and it's, there's more to the story, but to, to, to make a long story short, uh, not surprisingly, uh, it recommend, the Royal Commission recommended uh, a so-called hate law, so restrictions on free speech. It took another six years to come become legislation, but by 1971 we had the hate law. Now that can put you in, in send you to jail for up to five years um, for the non-violent expression of your political opinion, uh, and specifically it's, it, it says that you. Uh, it's a crime to willfully promote hatred against privileged groups. Now, that's race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, disability, and then most recently, whatever you want to call it, uh, the transgendered uh, and a sexual identification. And I think the latest figure, figures from Germany are there 57 d different sexual identifications. I, I kind of get hazy after about five, but uh, uh, okay. Uh, so that, that 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 law can send you to prison. Um, it's not used very often. There are some defenses, and um, we fought some very interesting cases. That's one thing. The second uh, type of legislation are, is human rights legislation. Now, each province has a human rights code. Some do not infringe on in freedom of speech. Some do. Uh, the problem with those codes, because they're considered civil, is that the level of proof is uh, much lower. Uh, it's, it's the balance of probabilities, uh, as, a, as opposed to beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, they theoretically cannot send you to jail, but they can fine you. Or, worse still, they can put you under a prohibition, and if you violate the prohibition, you go to jail. As, uh, uh, now, we, uh, until three years ago, uh, probably the, the, the um, most evil uh, piece of uh, human rights legislation was Section 13, aptly numbered, of the Canadian Human Rights Act. And that um, uh, made it a discriminatory practice to, uh, 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 by, you know, by repeated communication on the internet, so they, because that's really what they were targeting. On the internet, repeated communication that, that um, is likely to expose to hatred or contempt privileged groups, race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, etc. Um, uh, the, uh, th that was completely, that was almost impossible to defend because uh, um, to expose to hatred or contempt, uh, sorry, likely to expose the prosecution never had to prove that anybody, other than some complainant, ever read your post. That anybody uh, who had read it believed it, or, or even if he believed it, did anything. What's what is likely? So what? The word "likely to expose" was in, interpreted incredibly broadly. Uh, in, in other words, if it was there, it was likely uh, to expose to hatred or contempt. Even if you, figure, you think you know what hatred is, what's contempt? Well, contempt would be any ne negative comment about another, if believed. Uh, I'd like to use the example of uh, <clears throat> the fanatical campaign against smoking. Uh, depending on the jurisdiction, uh, uh, packages of cigarettes will have you know, obscene pictures of uh, blackened lungs or, or falling out teeth or, 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 shrink, or, or shriveled skin and, and, and so on, and with the idea that if you smoke, uh, well, you're probably a weak-willed 
lose your or, or you, you know you're, you're going to make yourself terribly sick and a burden on the public. Now I, I would say <clears throat> if smokers were a privileged group uh, under human rights legislation, the, that type of government-approved advertising would be exposing them. I don't know, maybe not to hatred, but contempt. I mean, if you believe what you see, you would say, well, smokers are not, not good people, or they're weak people, or bad people. So you've, you've lessened their other's opinion about those folks. So uh, that, that was a very, very dangerous piece of legislation, simply because it really was impossible to defend people. And I defended a fair number, uh, except as, if you could say, I didn't put it, this. Uh, I didn't post. But if your comments were critical of a privileged minority, it was likely going to be convicted. In fact, up until the Mark Lemire case, um, uh, no victim under Section 13 was ever found innocent. That tells you a lot about law. And we have all sorts of laws that, where people are found uh, are acquitted every day. Well, laws on you know, armed robbery, rape, murder, assault. Uh, yes, some people get convicted, some don't. But if you have a law where nobody ever get, is acquitted, uh, you, you've got to wonder about that law. Um, I, I helped all sorts of people, uh, none successfully actually. Um, uh, people, and, and you know, the, the, the main antagonist in all this was a, uh, an auto law lawyer who works for the Department of National Defense doing, nobody's quite sure what, at least we're not quite sure what, but he has an awful lot of time on his hands. And he filed complaint after complaint after complaint uh, against uh, uh, people who had critical views of uh, you know, the Hollywood version of World War II or certain uh, privileged minorities, homosexuals, um, uh, the, the Zionists, uh, third world immigration. Uh, and uh, th these were, for the most part, um, very small uh, people, I, I, I'm not referring to their stature or their importance, but these are ordinary individuals like teenage, uh, teenage girl, I, I remember Jessica Beaumont, uh, a, uh, a, a factory worker, Tom Winnicki, uh, you, you know, they're not trying to take down the uh, major communicators. Uh, the little people, going after people who in most cases had no resources, they couldn't hire a lawyer. Uh, and they, uh, quite often, they didn't know what hit them, had hit them. And, uh, you know, we in the Canadian Association for Free Expression uh, tried to help uh, where we could, provide them with some representation, and at least put up a fight for, for them. Uh, normally what would happen is that they would be hit with a fine and a cease and desist order. And what that meant was, well, actually, we're not quite sure what that meant. Uh, theoretically, it meant that they were not too uh, repeat the same passages that had been found to be a problem. In the case of Terry Tremaine, uh, who was a, was a prolific um, writer on Stormfront in around, in around 2004-2005, uh, eventually the courts decided that cease and desist meant he'd had to take the passages down. Uh, <clears throat> so, now, where, oh yes, it could, could get even worse. If the poor victim were to post something about the, the victimizer, in this case Richard Warman, uh, and if it was critical, uh, then Warman could go and, and uh, do the song and dance in front of the tribunal and say that there'd be retaliation. So, can you imagine a situation where, where, where some guy punches you in the face but if you say, that guy punched me in the face, that's an additional charge. You hurt his feelings. I mean, that's just, that was the, the absolute whack job world of, 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 the, of human rights, the Human Rights Commission. The, the, for, finally, due partly to our efforts, um, there was enough uh, uh, opposition in the back benches of the, then the, gov of the Conservative Party, the, the then government, uh, that a private member's bill w uh, was passed and it rescinded uh, re or re repealed Section 13. So that was definitely a, a big victory. Uh, but a lot of people got hurt along the way and people went to jail. Tom Winnicki, uh posted something different 
uh, than the passages that had been found to be a problem. And he was uh, sent to jail, for, well, for nine months, but then uh, on appeal it was cut back to time served, which I think was three months. Now, people go to jail for the non-violent expression of their political beliefs. That's something uh, the world has to be aware of. So uh, I'm really hoping someday when Canada gets up in the United Nations and is wagging its finger at Red China, rightly so of course, that the Chinese uh, 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 ambassador says, what about Mark Lemire? What about Terry Tremaine? What about Jessica Beaumont? Don't lecture us on, on, on freedom of speech. Of course China's an, an awful place, granted, but we're in no position to, to, uh, to be uh, Burnishing our credentials as a as a leader. Okay, there's there's a third area which which is very seldom used, but right now is a is the center of a big controversy, and that is the ministerial powers uh, under the Postal Act, uh, the Canada Post Corporation Act, and um, what the the act allows is for the minister to um, uh, to uh, suspend the mailing rights of a person. That means that that person cannot send or receive mail in Canada. Now that is a, a and that basically makes a, that individual a non-person. Now <clears throat> they, the minister can do that uh, basically on a whim. It's very seldom happened but interestingly when it has happened it has always been somebody uh, 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 be a free thinker on, uh, if you like, the, the right of the political spectrum. Um, back in the early 1980s, um, <clears throat> a revisionist publisher Ernst Sundel had his mailing uh, rights taken away. Uh, he had a good lawyer and uh, uh, he, uh, he appealed and had them back within six months. Uh, there was an, an old fellow who's an old uh, a National Socialist from the Second World War, uh, is a really cheerful individual, always promoting his ideas, uh, named John Ross Taylor. And uh, in the 60s, he had his mailing rights uh, cancelled, and uh, um, that never went to court. And actually, until the day he died in 1994, technically, he couldn't send or receive mail in Canada. But the current, the most uh, uh, current I I example of this, and this is one that uh, the Canadian Association for Free Expression is in a big battle right now, is a publication called Your War News. Now, Your War News um, is a quarterly, it's a tabloid, it's highly satirical, uh, it's a little bit like the Canadian version of uh, 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 the Canada Enchaîné in France, you know, a very uh, uh, over the line uh, politically incorrect, uh, zany, um, uh, and uh, uh, very, very satirical. Great cartoons and very thoughtful and, uh, and uh, uh, pointedly written uh, articles, all, pretty much all the creation of Dr. James Sears, who is the, uh, the editor. Now, it, it uh, has greatly offended the politically correct. Uh, Your War News takes on after uh, uh, radical feminists are the, the lesbian premier of the province of Ontario. Radical environmentalists, uh, uh, let me see, the, well, to some extent, uh, third world immigration, the, the homosexual lobby, uh, the Holocaust lobby, uh, and it, it's constantly coming up with with outrageous, politically incorrect things. A, 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 a little bit like. Um, like Mad, Mad Magazine, although not, not really all, all cartoons, uh, but the, uh, the important word there is satirical. Satire is not a, a, a political manifesto. It's the use of humor to make a point. And sometimes satire is really bouncing off the wall. One of the great satirical uh, uh, writings in the English language it, it is something called, is a piece I believe by Jonathan Swift called a, 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 a modest proposal, and, and he suggested that the way to deal with the poor uh, was cannibalism. Just eat them, 
Now, this wasn't a serious he proposal. He wasn't explaining to people how to make sausages out of poor people. Uh, th th this was satirical uh, to try to, uh, to make people perhaps a little more sensitive uh, to, to the fact there was a great deal of poverty in, in, uh, in industrial in industrializing England in the, at, the, at the end of the 18th century. <coughs> um, it, it was not meant to be taken literally. Unfortunately, the politically correct haven't, don't have a humorous bone in, in, in their wretched bodies and uh, they take, have taken huge offense at, great, at your war news. And there's been an ongoing campaign to destroy it. And you know, we have to be quite clear. Uh, if a person doesn't like your war news, hey, don't read it. Don't subscribe. Don't advertise. Your, 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 your course is clear. But the politically correct today are, are a very totalitarian uh, gang of people. They're neo-Puritans without religion. Uh, it used to be the Puritans wanted to, to uh, rule, run everybody's lives for them, but that was in the, that was in the name of God. Well, of course, the, the politically correct uh, have no God. They do have a religion. It's the religion of Holocaust, but uh, they, they don't have a God. So they're not doing it in the name of religion, but the, the, they think that, that you should not be allowed to express any opinion that they don't like. So the, the strategy, their strategy with your war news has been destruction from the very beginning. So a couple of years ago, they went after your war news as a community advertisers and managed to intimidate most of them. They also tried direct physical intimidation on your war news. They, they smashed the, 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 the window of their storefront at 163 Main Street in, in East End Toronto so many times it, it's now just all boarded up. And, and I think, that it, 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 uh, I just told Dr. Sears, I think um, uh, that you ought to spray paint on that. Don't, don't make it a plate board. Uh, windows broken by, uh, by terrorists. Uh, well, you know, shame the community. And uh, the locks on their doors are being sabotaged and the, all that type of thing. Well, the, the, neither of those are tactics because they're very tenacious. Um, so the, the, in the, about two years ago, uh, distribution was changed from, um, from uh, a private company to the post office. And uh, the circulation was, uh, was uh, increased to about 300, uh, I believe 350,000. <coughs> Per issue. Now, the, so now the post office was delivering it. Uh, this enraged the uh, politically correct and a coalition of uh, uh, the usual Zionist censorship groups, homosexuals, East End lesbians, um, uh, East End anti-racists, uh, the, the usual collection of people who want to do your thinking for you. Um, so the, the, uh, they then started pressuring the post office. Uh, they had a, a willing ally in the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. Uh, the, uh, the, post, the Postal Union is one of the last strongholds of the old Communist Party of Canada, Marxist-Leninists. These were the, who, what we used to call the Maoists. Uh, they came on the scene in the, in the 70s, and, uh, in the late 60s and, and the 90s, and the 70s. And in those days they were great admirers of Mao, but Mao did a, played a nasty trick on them. He died. Now, they didn't like it Mao's successor, so they transferred their loyalty to uh, the, 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 the closest uh, communist uh, hero uh, to, the, to their way of thinking, and that was Enver Hoxha. Now, you may not have heard of Enver because he's not exactly a household name, but he was the, the Stalinist dictator of, of Albania. So they were transferred their loyalties to Albania. Uh, <laughs> it always used to get a laugh out of their... Their newspaper was called People's Canada Daily News, and it was a broadsheet, and, uh, and, and most of the text type was in nine-point type. You know, you practically needed a, a magnifying glass to read it, and they would reproduce the speeches of Comrade Enver Hoxha. You know, can you imagine how many, many columns would it would take to reproduce a two-hour speech? Well, believe me, uh, I, I doubt there were more than two and a half people in all of Canada that ever read the thing cover to cover. And I always got a laugh out of it because it was called People's Canada Daily News. Well, it wasn't for our people. Uh, it wasn't about Canada. 
It didn't come out daily, and it certainly wasn't news. But uh, anyway, they, they still have a few people in the Canadian Union of Postal Workers. So they, uh, the, the postal workers then said they wouldn't deliver your war news uh, because it was racist, sexist, homophobic, uh, denied the so-called Holocaust, and uh, I don't know, anti-Semitic, uh, various other things. They just didn't like it. Well, the postal authorities told them, uh, well, it's not your job to... Uh, to, to like it or not like it, you're supposed to just deliver it. I mean, actually, you probably shouldn't be reading it. It's private mail. But. So uh, the, the, they, they struck out on that front. Um, so the, the next thing they tried to do was to, uh, they, they enlisted the, the help of Richard Warman. You know, the Warman, this paper comes out of the East End of Toronto, Warman's up in Ottawa. Uh, but <coughs> Warman took up the cause and he wrote to the minister of um, in charge of the post office and said that uh, uh, the, this was uh, the the paper was uh, hate propaganda, racist, sexist, homophobic, blah blah blah, and, and that uh, Canada Post shouldn't deliver it. Well, I don't think he got much of a response. So, Warman uh, seems to have an awful lot of time on his hands. So, the next thing you know, he, he's uh, filed a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Commission against uh, the the uh, Department of Supply and Procurement. That's the the government department in charge of the post office and the federal government. We're not quite sure what, where that complaint has gone. Uh, anyway, not long ago, that was in the spring of 2016, no, no, actually, back around March, I think. <coughs> a couple of months later, the minister in charge of the post office, and she was the minister of supply and government procurement, uh, Judy Foote, um, <coughs> um, served uh, the publisher Leroy St. Germain and the uh, uh, editor Dr. James Sears uh, with a prohibition order that uh, basically their mailing rights had been taken away and the justification she gave was that uh, the uh, uh, that she had re she had, uh, believed on reasonable grounds that your war news was violating, violating section 319 of the criminal code now that's the hate law and section uh, 390, which is uh, criminal libel. And uh, there it goes. Your, their right to send or receive mail, go on, and therefore your war news, roughly, be basically put out of business. At least that was their hope. I'll get to that in a moment. But uh, you, you might ask, well, how would, she, how would she justify that power? Well, she said she had reasonable grounds to believe. Well, I would say, uh, She's from Newfoundland. She's been drinking too much screech. That, that's this raw uh, Newfoundland uh, rum. In the old days, it was so, so wild, uh, they exported a lot of it in, in the Prohibition days down to the United States. Um, reasonable grounds to believe. Well, I would say reasonable might begin with if they've been convicted. Your war news has never been charged under Section 319, the hate law, has never been charged with defamatory law, with criminal libel. So she, her reasonable grounds to believe are utterly unreasonable. Um, nonetheless, that was supposed to be a body blow and to the paper. You can imagine a paper that uh, uh, <coughs> I believe at that time is coming out monthly, but it's now quarterly. But a, a, a paper that comes out uh, uh, ha has to reach its subscribers more or less within shooting date of the uh, the, the publication date. Well, if, you, if it can't be delivered, essentially you shut it down. Well, uh, your war news was very, very um, uh, resourceful, and uh, and so distribution was switched to private carriers who are paid to uh, to to drop the uh, drop the newspaper off. It's very expensive, uh, but but they have survived. Now you might say, well, is there any appeal? Uh, yeah. Uh, the victim has 30 days to request, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a technical name for it, but let's just call it uh, an appeal, uh, uh, an appeal board. Um, and Dr. Sears fire, uh, filed his uh, notice within the 30 days. So what happens next? Well, it's up to the minister to, uh, uh, to uh, appoint the appeal board. Yes. Yes. Months go by. Don't forget that was May. His appeal it was it was a request for appeal, uh, an appeal board in by the middle of June. In March of this year, Judy Foote, the minister, finally gets around to appointing uh, a, a 
uh, naming a, a three-person appeal panel. Uh, that too is a problem. Uh, the minister gets to choose the, the members of the, uh, of the appeal board. Uh, you, you can see what a joke this legislation is. Well, actually, it's a cruel joke on freedom. Um, your war news was, was cut off, uh, was not even granted an appeal uh, for 10 months. Well, I mean, granted the, the opportunity for an appeal. That was March. Uh, the board finally had, a, had its first meeting in, uh, in um, uh, April, April 27th. And um, uh, the hearings will go on. Meanwhile, your war, uh, Dr. James Sears and uh, Leroy Saint Germain uh, cannot receive or send mail in Canada. Your war news, to the extent that it depended on the post office, was shut down. This is utterly uh, outrageous and unjust, and it j just goes to show uh, something that uh, our good friend Doug Christie. Uh, the great Canadian free speech lawyer always said, he said, um, don't look to constitutions or bills of rights or charters of rights and freedoms for, for, to, to know what freedoms you have. You only have the freedoms you're prepared to fight for. And, uh, you know, there are many ways to take away people's liberty. And uh, um, uh, heartless uh, your uh, government uh, in, the, in the thrall of uh, and subservient to uh, minority special interest groups will will leech your freedoms away. Uh, you know, and bureaucrats are great at doing it, uh, uh, but by uh, bureaucratic means, right? just delay. Uh, anyway, this is going to be a big battle, well, well, probably the biggest uh, free speech battle this year. Um, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Sears has hired an extremely good criminal defense lawyer, uh, Frank Adario, and the first thing that uh, Mr. Adario has done is to challenge the constitutionality of the law, or the, those sections of the law. The, the, the fact that the minister can uh, arbitrarily um, take away a person's right to send or receive mail uh, without a hearing, uh, the fact that this can be done on just uh, basically her opinion, the, the fact that there's no easy way to challenge it, the fact that uh, the appeal board such as there is is not required to to convene in a timely fashion, um, and the fact that she gets to appoint the appeal board, um, well, that's just the beginning of what we believe are the reasons that the law will be struck down. And, and the reason I say it's going to be a, a real Donnybrook is that the uh, three uh, um, Jewish lobby groups have gained uh, what the Americans would call the Mikus Curiae status. We call it. Uh, Interested party or intervener status. That means they're they're in on they'll be participating in the hearing as will us. We the Canadian Association for Free Expression, as will the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, which is on our side, and a press freedom group from Ryerson University, which is on our side, <coughs> and some individuals. But the Canadian Jewish lobby takes this very seriously because they they see that they will possibly lose one of their. Um, well, one of their useful uh, uh, tools of thought control, and uh, well, I, I will will never use the term mailing privileges, and I urge others not to. I say the, 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 these are rights. We the, 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 can before we were even a dominion, and back into the 1850s, our ancestors paid taxes for postal service. We. We, as, uh, since we became a nation in 1867, we, we, have, uh, uh, we have paid as taxpayers for postal service. This is a right. It's not a privilege. It's not a situation where I have to put up my hand and say, may I, may I, big daddy. Uh, no, this is our right and uh, we'll not let it be taken away. So uh, well, I, I, I probably left some things out, but that is uh, uh, at least a quick uh, uh, overview of what's happening up here. Well, so anyway, in regard to free speech, I have a lot of pictures that go on the videos afterwards, like, leave my free speech alone, and you have people gagged, and, um, and it, it's important. Benjamin Franklin said, again, if you want to subdue a country, take away the free speech. Well, what was that you said, uh, the uh, well, freedom of speech? That if it's not freedom of speech <clears throat> for all, it's not freedom of speech at all. Yeah, that's a very good way to put it. If not for all, 
not at all. <clears throat> the uh, uh, and it, it, we run. We, I'm just speaking to her. I've just finished uh, with Alfred Schaefer. We ran into a, a lot of people, right? lots of very good people. But um, <clears throat> where he runs into opposition, uh, it's a, it's a bit depressing that there's a significant element of our population that does not get it. That's right. there, there, is, there is this thought that the minorities, particularly the homosexual lobby, have managed to uh, insert uh, that, uh, and the Holocaust lobby, that um, you don't have the right to offend somebody's feelings or to hurt their feelings. Now, uh, that is really pernicious because, first of all, it's, it, it, it's not across the board. You can run down whites, you can run down Christians, all you like. Uh, so it's, it's not a, a, an equal right. Um, and, but if it were an equal right, you, you'd have anarchy. You'd have, you, nobody would be able to say anything because in a diverse society, almost anything is going to offend somebody. For instance, I like to, uh, uh, to, to say that's as crazy as, as the belief the earth is flat. However, a significant number of people at some meetings I've addressed believe the earth is flat. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not my belief, but I, I don't want to get into a fight over it. But uh, you know, if they were tender souls and they were privileged, you know, let's say the LGBTQ XYZ messed up lobby, they they said, "Oh, I'm offended. Oh, my hurt. Oh, I, I don't feel comfortable." And um, I can cite a couple of other examples of just how dangerous things have become in Canada. There's a uh, law teacher at a uh, very prestigious Vancouver private school. And uh, late last fall, in, in one of his classes, his lectures to a senior class, which would be grade 12, people about 17 or 18, he said, just because something is the law doesn't mean everybody agrees with it. He said, and they said, for instance, I don't agree with the abortion laws. And they went on, and he didn't elaborate any further. Well, at the break in the class, uh, one of the popular girls in the school uh, stormed out of the class and didn't with a couple of her friends and didn't come back and sh she went to uh, another teacher and said that that she had been triggered that's the first time I've ever heard that word other than uh, the use of a gun but she'd been triggered a and um, she's very uh, she's very upset and she didn't feel safe in this class anymore uh, and he didn't have a right to an opinion because he's a man well the other teacher went to him and said you, you know, there's a problem here. So he went to the girl and he apologized and said, I didn't mean to upset you, but I'm only telling you the truth. Just because something is law doesn't mean everybody agrees. In fact, that's one of the ways laws change. If enough people disagree with a law, maybe it will get changed. Anyway, uh, that, well, that didn't satisfy her. She went to the principal. <coughs> the principal went to him and said, you're in a lot of trouble. He said, um, you have to apologize. Well, he apologized. He said, "But I don't have anything to apologize for. I didn't mean to upset her, uh, and um, but it's the truth. I'm only telling the truth in my area of law." And uh, so he, he apologized again, and then he was called in a couple of days later, and he was told, "You're in a lot of trouble." Um, he says, "Well, uh, uh, I mean, I, I think I'm a very effective teacher." The principal says, "Yes, you're a very, a very effective teacher. You're one of the best." and you're fired because our first duty is to protect the safety of our students. Now, that girl felt, said she felt unsafe because she'd heard an idea she didn't agree with. Now, that is scary. Mm -hmm. And really what we're doing in a society where we give into it to, to, to uh, the un, un, emotionally unstable people like this is we're, we're creating a monster. You can't protect yourself. What that girl, that young lady, really needs is for somebody, or be careful how I put it, perhaps her father or mother, to put her, to, to put her snotty uh, self over their knee and give her, give her a good spanking. Okay, tell her, you know, you're 17 or 18, deal with it. You're going to hear a lot of things in life you don't agree with. Learn, learn to live with it. And th th there are examples like this happening all across the country. Uh, uh, of people losing their job, in many cases not even for anything really political. Um, the, um, we just had a, kind of a big defeat this past Thursday. Uh, the Senate uh, passed Bill C-16 
Now that, um, and that, it, that's the final step before it becomes law. And Bill C-16 adds um, uh, gender identification and transgenderism to the li long list of grounds uh, upon we, which we may, may not discriminate or against uh, or uh, under which you cannot uh, well uh, you, could, you could be charged under the hate law or human rights law um, so from now on if we talk about those who are seriously mixed up well, they now call them non-binary some of them are non-binary I have to, have to go to the math book to figure out what bi binary is is one or you know one or two, two. two. So it's you know, if it's something is binary, it's either one or two. So somebody who is non-binary, I guess it's just mixed up. They're not sure whether they're a man or a woman. And the, the, okay, these people. Uh, well, at least according to the American uh, Journal of uh, Pediatric Science, uh, to the people who uh, are considered transgender operations or hormone treatment for, for, for children uh, are really in, involved in something like child abuse. Uh, the, 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 it's a form of mental illness. Uh, so, uh, do we cater to the mentally ill? It caters, I mean, well, why should we have to play in their fantasy backyard? Uh, you know, if, if I wake up tomorrow morning and believe I'm Napoleon and I walk into the Tim Hortons and insist that everybody address me as emperor, uh, well, I'm alright, you know, that's, that's my fantasy, that's my mental illness. They shouldn't have to call me emperor just, just to, 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 to avoid going to, getting, uh, uh, getting charged or fined. Um, under this legislation, um, important people like Professor Jordan Peterson of the University of Toronto uh, and a number of lawyers believe that uh, the Human Rights Act will now be able to compel uh, people to use the, uh, the fantasy confusion uh, of the sexually confused uh, and if you don't you could, go, you could be punished, fined, maybe even fired. Um, and the one issue at the University of Toronto is that the transgendered and the sexually mixed up uh, want to be called other pronouns like uh, the, the, I think the, the Z and Zer, or sometimes they, uh, and Professor Peterson said, "No, I will, I will address you as what you appear to be. If you're a male, I'll call you mm -hmm. he or him, or female, uh, she or her. Um, and uh, you, know, you know, if you're mentally unbalanced and, and you want to be called Zer, uh, sorry, it's I'll call you what you look like, mm -hmm. and, and, and and rightly so, you know." Uh, it, but uh, he was warned by his own university, and that's before C-16 C passed, that he could uh, face human rights problems. He, he would be discriminating against them. Uh, that, which means well, you have to, uh, uh, you, you have to uh, play in, in the fantasy sandbox uh, of, of the disturbed. And uh, another example that just came my way last week, uh, one of the great evangelical crusaders is uh, my friend Bill Watcott. Now Bill has made it his mission to try to um, <clears throat> reach out to the homosexual lesbians and try to convince them that, 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 that what they're doing is morally wrong and health-wise not very good. So he uh, uh, goes to gay rallies and hands out Bible tracts and condoms and uh, uh, he's a, a little bit like the Your War News, a really zany uh, type of guy, uh, and very spirited, and has paid a horrible, horrible price in terms of job loss. He's be, he was kicked out of the, the nursing profession because of his views on abortion. Not because he was a bad nurse, he was a great palliative care nurse. Uh, another person who suffered brutally for his religious and, uh, uh, and other beliefs. But anyway, he's now, <laughs> he's now before the, uh, the uh, British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal. And what happened was in the, very, in the recent, I believe, May 8th uh, provincial election in British Columbia, Bill Watcott handed out leaflets <clears throat> in a downtown swing riding where uh, the NDP or the Socialist Party candidate uh, was a, uh, uh, an out, of, out, out there uh, transgender. Born a male, 
has fathered kids, but now says it's a female. And uh, uh, Lockhart handed out leaflets, roughly saying that, um, that this man is uh, <coughs> violating the, or this creature is violating the law of God, uh, is mixed up. Now, is, is that really the sort of person you want to elect as your representative to the provincial legislature? Yes. Yes. <laughs> now, it's in a very homosexual writing. Uh, and Watcott may well have changed the course of British Columbian history. Maybe. Uh, uh, it's, it, as I said, it's complicated. Um, the, tra the transgendered nearly won, but didn't. Um, Watcott thinks, uh, he didn't have any luck with the homosexuals he had in the, the literature up to, but a lot of Chinese in the writing looked at this, and, and as they tr tried to get into their uh, get their heads around what it meant, were, were repulsed. Uh, the Chinese are fairly traditional people, and they're not, they're not big on the LGDB, LGBTQ mixed up. <laughs> and and he, uh, the other party, the Liberal Party, won only by a couple hundred votes. Did Watcott change history? We don't know. But um, in the course of leafleting, uh, he was uh, beaten up by two lesbians, oh. chased out of buildings, screamed at, spat at, abused. <laughs> But that's not the, the worst of it. He was then charged under the BC Human Rights Act by the transgender creature. So, in uh, so what happens is uh, uh, Watcott, uh, the complainant, uh, sends, sends a, a statement of of what was wrong and the offense, and then Watcott makes a response, a written response. Well, he recently, this past week, he got a very stern letter that the response was unacceptable. Because he was he was calling the complainant he uh, or him, uh, and this is violating uh, this person's dignity. And if this continues, he could be saddled with costs. Now, Bill Watcott is virtually penniless, uh, so Watcott is being forced to say what he does not believe. Now, on, and on, I would say on very reasonable grounds, the creature more or less looks male or was born male. Uh, what, uh, so Watcott is, is being would be forced to call the creature her, or the only way he could get around it would be simply in, in every sentence to just to put the proper name in. Uh, that is like uh, the story of many of the Christian martyrs who who were told we, the torture will stop, the the beating, the boiling, the the fire, the if you will just renounce the, the, the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And people, many, many men and women died because of that. Uh, here, okay, it's not quite as dramatic, uh, but uh, uh, still, why should a, a, a sensible, reasonable person be, be forced uh, to, uh, to play into somebody's fantasy? A, a, any more than if I walk into my, my donut shop and insist people address me as, uh, as, as emperor because I think I'm Napoleon. Uh, they shouldn't have to, and we shouldn't have to. Exactly. I appreciate that. It's a, it's a downhill spiral in both of our societies, both of our countries, when we reject the, the truths that are being forced upon us in the lives. One, of, one mentioned about the uh, sausage, and I was thinking of when Jim talks about the, the sausage lady who goes from school to school as a Holocaust survivor saying the Germans turned Jews into sausage and bologna and other lunch meats. And h how can you possibly believe this? But you do, because we're told to, and she's been encouraged to, she's never been challenged. And so that, there's no one to stand up, again, the, the emperor in the, new uh, the, the new clothes type thing, the elephant in the room. That's what we're doing. We're shining a light on the truth of it, and we're being despised for it. But that's part of the job. You've been doing this for decades. Jim's been doing it for decades. So it's, uh, it's something that needs to be maintained. A gentleman last night said to me, it's very discouraging. Absolutely, it's very discouraging. This is not an easy battle. Not, nothing when you're in a, in a kind of revolutionary mindset of trying to return people to a sanity that they're rejecting and being forced to and told to and compelled to and threatened to. It's difficult to return to, to this, uh, our roots, if you will, where our roots have been corrupt in the beginning, uh, listening to uh, Jim's brother Joe talk about our history, 
we were we were uh, jettisoned and subverted from the very beginning. A lot of Jewish influence in our in our early in our early American history. So we keep presenting videos. We keep presenting people who have their finger on the on the uh, pulse of what's going on, like like Paul Fromm and and numerous others. And I wanted to for him to uh, introduce us to some of the uh, characters in Canada who have suffered as a result of these draconian rules. That at the the final analysis, when the, the final scenario, as even the Chinese reject. You know, and they're one of your biggest invaders. But they have become somewhat, in their response to this LGBT stuff, voice of reason by virtue of their actions. Oh, yes. And, and this is one of the things that terrifies me. And people like my good friend in Seattle, uh, Dr. James Sanchez, uh, uh, the, the future of America uh, with uh, massive immigration and therefore a declining IQ yes. rate, um, the growth of the Chinese economy and military, and technology, a lot of it's stolen, but uh, uh, fine. Uh, they are a coming power, and they don't have any use for this moral degeneracy of the LGBTQ XYZ. And when I saw that the, the Kenyan or your president there only in in 2011 having a special ceremony in December, just around the time of Sandy Hook, honoring the, uh, the 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 gays and the lesbians in the military, I, I imagine what the the generals in Peking must have been thinking. They, they must have been choking on their on their egg rolls, laughing. Absolutely. I mean, this is going to be this is going to be the opposition. They're, they're still, America is still militarily strong and all that, but uh, but but when you when, when you're morally confused and have lost your way, as we have in Canada, when when you can't figure out what a marriage is, uh, that's a man and a woman. You know, not two men, as our Supreme Court thinks, or two women, or a man and a dog. Um, uh, well, you can't even get those basics rights, which are almost universal of almost all religions. When you can't get that right, you're going to get a lot of other things wrong. You know, you're, will you be able to defend your borders? Um, well, no, all you do is you just redefine that they're not illegals. Uh, they're, they're irregular migrants, said our Minister of Public Security, Ralph Goodale, a couple of months ago. He's in charge of protecting Canada. Uh, they're irregular migrants. Strikes me like a bird that got blown off its course by a hurricane. No, they're not irregular migrants. They're, 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 they are scumbag criminal illegals. Uh, but you know, when you, when, when you can't get even the basics right, you're going to get the, the complicated stuff wrong. That scares me. Uh, America today, yes, can it will be able to defend itself, and hopefully, as long as Donald Trump's president, uh, it, it won't get much worse. But um, uh, what will it be like in a generation or two? Uh, I really worry about that. I would too. You know who rules you by whom you're not allowed to criticize. That's right. Yes, and right so. now it's it, it's the the Holocaust lobby and the LGBTQ XYZ sexually mixed up. Yes. Uh, you, you can criticize liberals, you can criticize conservatives, you can criticize business, you can criticize labor. Germans. Oh, Germans. Well, everybody, everybody can criticize Germans. Yeah, they're number one. Uh, Christians and, and white people. But you may not cr criticize these others. Well, uh, the work you're doing, the uh, work we, we try to do in helping others, and uh, your war news and a lot of other good patriots mm -hmm. around the, the West are uh, are uh, criticizing the uh, are, are saying that those gods are false. Absolutely, absolutely, and the emperor has no clothes. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll be back again with more up and coming, uh, cutting edge individuals who will be telling the truth, like it or not. And I'm hoping that you'll like it. And uh, we'll, this is Diane King, and we'll see you later.